Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True, or if you're new, welcome to 10% True. This is the first short video in a mini series I'll be publishing to showcase the RASBAM F15E Strike Eagle module for Eagle Dynamics DCS Flight Simulator. For regulars of the channel, don't panic, I'm not abandoning my core goal to document the experiences of military aviators, just think of this as a temporary sideline. And if you're new here, be sure to check out my catalogue of fighter aircrew interviews, uh, including a solid set of Strike Eagle interviews, I'll put a link in the description. In fact, if you subscribe and hit the bell button, you'll get notified when my forthcoming F-15E in the Balkans interviews are published early next year. They're well worth waiting for. This mini-series will discuss the history and the development of the Strike Eagle and provide an overview of some of the things that make it so special. I should say that these are not how-to videos. There are some actual Strike Eagle operators working with RASBAM and producing videos based on real-world use of the jet, so I will leave that to them. And as you'd expect, this all comes with caveats and disclaimers. First, I'm not allowed to discuss the completeness or incompleteness of the module. Second, it's not my place to discuss or hint at release dates. And third, as you know, this is all work in progress and therefore subject to change. So with the intro out of the way, let's talk Strike Eagle. In 1978, the US Air Force issued a study to evaluate an airframe that would initially supplement and then replace the General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark. It was called the Tactical All-Weather Requirements Study. The F-111 had played a crucial role as both a nuclear and conventionally armed deterrent and was particularly well suited for the European theatre. It had extensive range and ability to carry many tons of bombs to even the most distant European choke points and could penetrate defended airspace at low level in all weathers day or night. But it was getting long in the tooth, and it was also in relatively short supply, with only two wings available in Europe. Tactical all-weather requirement study eventually became known as the dual role fighter, and the minimum expectation was that it would match the performance and capabilities of the F-111F. It was no coincidence that McDonnell Douglas, makers of the legendary F-15 Eagle, and Hughes, makers of the APG-63 radar that were its eyes, were already working on an advanced concept demonstrator based on the Eagle when the DRF requirement progressed to become a competition in the early 1980s. The two companies had watched the Air Force's requirements unfold and become more acute over time and had already spent significant amounts of their own money to develop a solution they called the Advanced Fighter Capability Demonstrator. The AFCD was based on the two-seat F-15BD, and was an ideal platform for the deep strike precision guided role. Between 1980 and 1982, Macaire had set to work building a missionized cockpit that would set the scene for the Strike Eagle's brilliant and ergonomically optimized front and rear cockpits. This included the development of a new wide field of view heads up display, hands on throttle and stick setups for front and rear cockpits, and a set of multi purpose displays driven by a dedicated display computer on which the crew could call up a slew of information through a series of pages. With a weapon systems officer occupying this missionized rear seat, there would be someone to concentrate exclusively on target acquisition and sensor operation during the attack phase of the flight. The APG-63 already had an air-to-ground mapping and ranging capability, and although the Air Force wasn't keen on advertising the fact, a small number of Eagle squadrons flew continuation training sorties in the air-to-ground mission, dropping unguided general-purpose bombs using the Eagle's continuously computed impact delivery mode. Now, Hughes set to work developing those capabilities and adding new air-to-air -air and air-to-ground modes, including the famous patch mapping capability that allows the crew to take what amounts to a radar photograph of the target that can then be used to designate off of. Yet McCair's design was no shoe-in, it had shortcomings, most notably around range. The F-15 had much shorter legs than the F-111F, even when using a new form of conformal fuel tank, known colloquially at Macaire as the fast pack, it still lacked 30% of the Aardvark's range. This would need to be addressed if it were to stand a chance of winning. In fact, the fast pack concept also held the key to meeting payload requirements. It was from these that both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground stores would be hung. As we'll see in another video, these eventually became known simply as conformal fuel tanks, or CFTs. The dual role fighter competition started in November 1982 and ran for around six months with some 200 plus sorties flown. The other competitor, General Dynamics and its F-16XL entry, was comprehensively beaten in most regards. 
The AFCD had earned the win in several respects. It had demonstrated a £75,000 takeoff capability, which was £7,000 heavier than previously. It had successfully merged a target pod, APG-63 synthetic aperture radar mapping and attack systems together and had applied these technologies to pass the Air Force's visual and radar bombing accuracy requirements. So, with its assessments and deliberations complete, the Air Force awarded the contract to build the next generation deep strike fighter to McDonnell Douglas on the 24th of February 1984. The aircraft would be designated the F-15E and called the Strike Eagle. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks and take care.